and welcome back to Make It Heard with our Introducing the Writer. We've been away for a little while, but we've got a really good show for you tonight. With me tonight is Anne Pritchard, and I'm just going to ask her a few questions. So, first of all, Anne, when did you actually start writing? Well, um, I always enjoyed writing from when I was young and I was in school. My favourite subject was always English right through my school days and I always loved writing essays and so on. I got quite a few compliments anyway for some of my work but um, that kind of fell by the wayside as I got older and I pursued different things really and um, took a different path and ended up at Liverpool Art College and then of course from there just thrust into work and life and marriage and motherhood I'm a mother to two sons and a grandmother to three grandchildren, a girl and two boys. When my sons were young, we lived abroad in Hong Kong. And, um, I taught at a kindergarten there, which was an international kindergarten. Um, children from all over the world. Um, and I always entertained them with made up stories and plays. And although they were from many, many diverse backgrounds and different cultures, they always seemed to enjoy it and we always tried to make it fun. At the moment, I review theatre productions for reviewer number nine and North West End. And I also review books for a lot of leading publishers. So when did you start writing again? Well, from memory, um, round about 2012, I think I attended a creative writing course delivered by Writing on the Wall. After I'd seen the course advertised at my library and I decided I had the time then to start writing again. I'd started writing a novel in my spare time based on my parents' life story and basically I was looking for guidance to complete it. Um, after that I entered Writing on the Wall's Pulp Idol competition and again to place in the final and then one of my stories was featured in a WOW publication entitled Watch Your Story and it was a combination of short stories, I think that was around about 2013. And then I was um, lucky enough to gain a place at John Moore's University on their MA writing course. Um, this is whilst I was in the 60s. Um, again, because I had the time to do it and I thought I'd pursue writing again. Have workshops been useful for you, Anne? Um, I've attended a lot of writing workshops and courses over the years. And more recently, um, the Play is the Thing, a playwriting course led by Grin Theatre's artistic director, Kiefer. Wesley Williams. That's in the Everyman. Just before the first lockdown, we managed to have a few sessions there. And then of course we had to go on to Zoom. How did you get involved with Make It Right? Make It Right were looking for volunteers to help out. And uh, I offered my services mainly with stage decor. Um, and then I joined the Thursday night writing group. I've written various monologues for Grin Theatre's Rainbow Monologues. Monologues for the Make It Right Big Condo Compendiums and the Make It Right Writing Together. And also a duologue for the Make It Right Jukebox Challenge. There we came fourth place. That was out of 20, so that's really good. So what kind of things do you like to write and what platforms do you like? Basically realist, memoir, the thriller, conspiracy, action fiction or psychological. So what inspires you to write, Anne? Mainly past personal experiences at the moment, experiences of family members or friends, and just a need to share thoughts and ideas. And for people starting out, what's your writing process, Anne? Well, once an idea takes hold, I start making notes, trying to outline the plot and gathering information. I really enjoy the research part of writing, particularly if it's fact-based, and I enjoy talking to people who've live through interesting experiences. Drafting and final revision comes next with editing, proofreading and getting other interested eyes to look it over and read it to provide the valuable feedback. What advice has been invaluable to you, Anne? Well, I see writing as a form of expressing yourself, either to tell a story, whether it's a direct recounting of something personal from life or a fictional reworking of a lived experience or a work of made up fiction. Whichever it is, I'd encourage anyone to get it down on paper. It's a testament to the writer's imagination and it's worth sharing. It takes courage to transpose the thoughts 
in one's head to a piece of blank paper, but I would say just do it. Join a group of like-minded people who indulge in writing and performing. Find the courage to voice your thoughts and ideas and stay true to yourself. Don't be put off if people aren't on the same way in length and just don't get it. Believe in yourself and make time. Find time to indulge in writing. Very wise words, Anne. Thank you very much. And without further ado, let's listen to some of your work. This is Love is Just a Four Lesser Word and it's by Anne Pritchard and it's recorded by Francesca Maria Itzo for Make It Heard. Mum was a great one for quotations. She had one framed on a bedroom wall, one she'd embroidered herself. That was one of her passions, sewing, along with drawing. The quotation was won by Lewis Carroll and said, In the end, we only regret the chances we didn't take, the relationships we were afraid to have, and the decisions we waited too long to make. I didn't understand it much when I was a kid. I just liked the colours of the sewing thread she'd chosen to embroider it with. When she passed away, I came across her diaries. I was torn whether to read them or not. You know what I mean? It felt like I'd be spying on her. But then I decided that reading her innermost feelings was one way to really get to understand her. And right or wrong, I thought it was an opportunity not to be missed. I sat down with a glass of wine and started to read a section which grabbed my attention. It was from a time after her and dad were divorced. She'd gone to a party with an ex. Some friends were christening their baby. And after the church, they all went back to the friend's house to celebrate. The ex had left her for a short while, as had been a problem he'd had to sort out at home. Mum had wandered into the kitchen to refill her wine glass, when two women she'd spoken to briefly at the church joined her, and she filled up their glasses as they started chatting. Where was her other half? One of them had asked her. She explained what had happened, and the woman said, You mean, he's left you here on your own? A gorgeous woman like you, left here all by yourself? He must be mad! God, that's something I'd never do if I was with you. You're lovely. The woman looked deeply into Mum's eyes and then said, Can I kiss you? Before she could reply, she felt the woman's lips on hers, and she wrote she had never experienced a kiss like it. She described the woman's lips as being the softest she'd ever felt. She said she couldn't describe how delicious it felt, and that she didn't want it to end. She said she felt an electric tingle going through her body an exquisite experience unknown to her before. When she opened her eyes, the woman was looking at her intently and she realised that she'd taken hold of her hand and was squeezing it gently. A loud voice of someone calling to the woman brought Mum back to the present and the woman was caught up in another conversation. Mum said she stood, transfixed, feeling somehow foolish. She wrote that she couldn't stop thinking about the woman. She longed to tell someone about it, but knowing no one would understand, she kept it to herself, often wondering how things could have been if she'd reacted more positively to that kiss on her admirer. She recalled how she'd never been interested in women before that kiss, never looked at a woman in a sexual way. But since that kiss, she'd thought of nothing else. It was strange thinking about mum and fancying a woman. I took a big gulp of wine and continued reading. Mum wrote about wanting to reconnect with her first love, painting, and had started a master's degree. She described how she loved being the old girl in a class full of cool young artists and wished she'd done it sooner. It was while she was setting up at the life drawing class, she heard the tutor introducing the life model. She wrote how she couldn't believe her eyes as she looked up and recognised the woman disrobing. It was the woman from the party. As mum started to sketch, she described how she wrestled with the desire and recalled the many emotions she'd experienced whilst remembering the thrill of that kiss, still vivid in her memory. 
Her hand was shaking and she couldn't control it as she tried to do justice to the seductive curves of the woman lounging before her. She wrote how she couldn't concentrate, how she felt her face blushing, bright red, and how she couldn't wait for the class to finish so she could speak to the woman and hope she'd recognise her. As the tutor brought the session to a close, Mum wrote how she hurriedly tidied up and quickly left the room to chase after the woman. She'd ran down the corridor, nearly fell down the steep stairs, hoping desperately to see her. But she was nowhere in sight. Mum couldn't believe how she could have disappeared. But she was gone. Mum said she spent the rest of the day thinking about what could have been. She chided herself for not having the guts at the party to let the woman know she was interested in her. She tried to find out at uni about the woman, but it seemed she'd been filling in that day and they didn't have her contact details. The words of the Lewis Carroll quotation Mum had embroidered came back to me, and I understood why it meant so much to her. There was a folded piece of paper in the back of the diary. I knew before opening it what it was. It was the sketch Mum had done. As I admired it, I suddenly gasped as I looked at the face and I realised I recognised the woman staring back at me. It was that bitch who'd broken up my parents' marriage. The one Dad had fallen for. The one he cheated on Mum with. It wasn't some cheap, sleazy affair, he'd said. It was love, with a capital L. He'd married her as soon as Mum divorced him. And Mum had never met her. I had, of course. Dad wanted me to get to know her, but I'd grown tired of playing happy families with them and gradually refused the invites he'd sent me. I wondered how he'd react to knowing that the love of his life had betrayed him, and with my mum, his ex. As I put the diary in my bag, I couldn't wait to tell him. was Love is Just a Four Letter Word, written by Anne Pritchard and performed by Francesca Maria Izzo, for Make It Heard. We know what we are, but not what we may be. A short story by Anne Pritchard. Wouldn't you like to have me for a sweetheart? Wouldn't you like to have me for a bull? Wouldn't you like to whisper me your secret about as well as any girl you know? Wouldn't you like to meet me in the starlight? Wouldn't you like to have my sympathy? Wouldn't you like the conversation? Wouldn't you like the consolation of a little girl like me? The small room was becoming unbearably hot. The cold fire was blazing in the earth. The chief stalker, Pop, was carefully selecting the next piece of coal from the skull, which he lays gently on the earth, ready to be precisely placed on top of the pyre. We're all sitting round the fire, like we always do once we've had our tea, and the table has been cleared, the dishes washed and dried and put away. We've pulled the green sofa up close to the fireplace, me and Mum always sit next to each other. Pops in his chair on one side of the earth, smoking his pipe. Every now and then, he spits into the fire. It makes a loud hissing sound, as it puts out some of the flames before they burn up again. Nin's in her chair on the other side of the fire, her legs crossed on the earth. She's got her head back, eyes closed gently rocking the chair and humming to herself. I'm sorting out the seeds from a melon, putting them onto a piece of paper to dry in front of the fire. It's one of my projects. I'm making a necklace from the seeds. Once they're dry, I'll thread them onto a piece of cotton and paint them. As I lay the paper down onto the earth, I see a baby cockroach running up Nin's leg. I don't know whether to tell her or not, and decide not to. It'll only disturb her. She looks happy, 
gently rocking in her chair. Last night, I did a drawing of her legs. She's got good, sturdy legs, with lots of nobbles on her knees, and I thought I'd captured them quite well. I felt quite proud of it. When I showed her, she said, Yeah, my legs are horrible, aren't they? And she made me feel really sad. I was sorry I'd drawn them then. It wasn't what I'd hoped she'd say and I felt all empty inside. Mum's got her leg bent, with her foot resting on the sofa. Her chin's on top of her knee. She's cutting her toenails, attacking her big toe. The small nail scissors she's using are straining to do the job in hand. She's at her happiest when she's attending to her feet, either picking the skin from around her nails or pulling the nails off. She's got a page from last night's echo on the floor to catch the clippings. We're all listening to the wireless. Friday night is music night is on. We've already listened to Sing Something Simple and Victor Sylvester and his orchestra are playing You're Dancing on My Heart as the front door slams. <coughs> Mum immediately looks at the clock on the sideboard. The East West Home's best plaque next to it has got a crack in the glass and I've always wondered how it got there. And I can hear footsteps on the lino in the hall. Stiletto heeled shoes are walking gingerly towards us and the living room door is flung open. I stare at my sister, Linda. Her carefully applied red lipstick has vanished from her lips. They look swollen and raw, almost too big for her face. All the other makeup she took pains putting on to perfection earlier has disappeared and her face looks as if it's been licked all over. A blonde bouffant air is messy, half up and half down. Not at all like the Ellen Shapiro look she'd been trying to mimic before she went out. You've been out with that lad again, haven't you? Mum says angrily. It was me who'd carefully applied my sister's makeup four hours earlier. Me who's put on her false eyelashes, the glue spreading everywhere except on the right places. Me, who dyed her hair the previous night, back from ash blonde to a lovely shade of lilac. It was me who'd applied her false nails. And me, who'd stayed up all night the night before making the blue mini dress with the halter neck she had on. She'd been out with her fella. They'd been to see the Beatles at the Grafton. And before she'd left the house, Mum had hidden her makeup and tried to bar her way to stop her leaving the house. She'd stood in the narrow hallway with her arms outstretched, just touching the walls either side, and told Linda she wasn't to go out. Linda had just stormed past her, knocking her arms down, and out of the door she went, stiletto heels clattering on the lino. The furthest I'd been all week was to my weekly prayer meeting. But when I got back, Mum said there'd been two lads knocking at the door asking after me. I ran round to my friend Carol's house to see if she knew what it was about. She was sitting on the front doorstep doing a bit of courting with her boyfriend, Fred, and they laughed when I told her why I was there. Oh yeah, Fred smirked. It's Alan and Kenny. They saw you in the library last week and couldn't help but admire the pants you had on. It seems I looked dead sexy in my black black crisky pants, which were the latest fashion. I knew the pants with the straps under my feet made my legs look twice as long and lycra was hot off the press as the new sensual fabric for any fashionable teenager who wanted to look with it. Carol told me there was a party in the next street and they said they'd walk round there with me. It was an open invitation to anyone who had the latest records or a couple of bottles of beer to share. We could hear the ollies belting out, stay, as we rounded the corner of the street 
and pushed our way through the small hallway past some lads with their arms around a couple of girls trying to look cool, smoking. We went into the back room and Alan and Kenny were there, talking. Well, Fred said to me, who's it going to be? Alan or Kenny? Take your pick. We know what we are, but not what we may be, was written by Anne Pritchard and featured Francis Brodie Aldridge. Wouldn't you like to have me for a sweetheart? Was sung by Ada Jones. Teen Beat was played by Sandy Nelson. The Enchanted Sea by the Islanders. All tracks featured are in the public domain or within copyright usage. This was a Francis Brodie production for Make It Heard. This is I'll Remember You by Anne Pritchard and acted by Jill Powell for Make It Heard. Well, the day's arrived, as I knew it would, but still, I've been dreading it. Every night before I've gone to sleep, I've wished it wasn't going to arrive. I've almost hoped I wouldn't wake up to see it arrive, if you know what I mean. But it's got to be faced. I've got to get it over. I've got to get through it. <sighs> Funerals. I've always hated them. Who doesn't? But this one, your dad's, well, I can't help hating it more. Oh. There'll be a big turnout. Besides all the family that's left, there's all his mates and the people he worked with. All his union sidekicks as well, plus all the neighbours. You know how well liked he was and how well thought of he was. Everyone liked him, didn't they? He's always got time for people, always got time for a chat, people would say to me. He'd make time for people, I know. He couldn't pass anyone in the street without saying, hello, how are you doing today? Or something like that. He had the gift of the gab all right, always had it, from when I first met him. That's one of the things I liked about him. And your gran said to me when she first met him, he's a good un pet. Any man who can make you laugh is worth his weight in gold. You'll not go far wrong with him, take my word for it. And then she whispered. If a man can laugh you into bed, he's a keeper. He's always laughing, people would say. 
And he's always got a joke to share. He can brighten anyone's day up with a funny tale. He's got a smile a mile long and such a handsome face. You're so lucky to have a man like him, they'd say to me. Has he got any brothers? I could do with one like him. I'd just laugh and nod and go along with the joke, not really knowing what to say back to them. He worked up till his dying day as well. He loved his job. He couldn't think about retiring, he said. Couldn't imagine not going to work each day, not having that routine. He really loved his job. All his workmates thought the world of him. Well, you know that. They were always telling you if they bumped into any of them. And they'd always say we were the first on their guest list for any parties and get togethers they were having. And our house was never empty. Always one of his mates knocking round to ask his advice or wanting him to join them in the pub. He was the life and soul of the party, all right. I've been thinking about the service. When the vicar came round to talk it through, I gave him all the details about your dad. I had to, because, well, <laughs> he doesn't know us from Adam. We've never set foot inside a church since the wedding. I had to give him the names of all his brothers and sisters and so on. He wrote it all down. Just as well, I mean, there's so many of them. And I told him how well liked he was and so on. I told him to expect a crowd and <laughs> they'll probably want to play a few tunes for him. His mates from the band, will, well, they'll all bring their instruments, you know. They'll want to do that. They'll give him a good send off all right. One thing though, the vicar said he thinks I should say a few words at the service. They call it a eulogy, don't they? Saying something about the person who's died. I told him I, I couldn't do anything like that. I mean, I I'm not a good speaker. Standing up in front of all those people. I, I couldn't do it, I told him. But he told me to find the courage to do it. He said, I'll be glad if I do it. Said it'll stay in my memory and help me to remember him. He said it'll give me comfort and help me deal with his passing. Well, I've been turning it over in my mind and yeah, I think he's right. I think I should do it, the, the eulogy thing. I, I think I should say something. Well, I've been thinking about what to say. I know everyone will be waiting for me to say what a good man he was, how kind he was, what a good husband he was. So I've decided I think I should definitely say something. Do you think I'll be too nervous? or too upset to do it. I can see what's going through your mind. You're worried about me. Worried I'll fluff my words or break down in front of everyone. But don't worry. I'll be okay. I can do it. I want to do it. Now that I've put my mind to it, I'm determined to do it. I think it's only right that I do it. It's you I'm worried about. It's you that might break down and get upset when I start speaking about him. Your dad. He was the best dad in the world to you. Gave you everything you wanted. Daddy's little girl. But I'm not going to talk about your dad. I'm going to talk about my husband, 
the man I was married to for over 30 years. The man everyone loved. The man who was everyone's best friend and who all my mates wanted to be married to. I want to talk about the man only I knew. The bastard I was married to. The man who spent all our money on beer and one-armed bandits in the pub. The man who gambled all our money on the horses and the dog racing at the bookies. The man who was always laughing with his mates and joking with everyone. Until he came home from the pub and beat me black and blue when he got in if his dinner wasn't what he wanted or if I asked him for money for the week shopping. I want to tell them about the man they didn't know. The man who wouldn't let me have a life of my own. The man who controlled me. The man who wouldn't let me go out without him. Who kept me short of money. Who mentally and physically abused me for years. The man who tormented me and enjoyed it. But I had to keep quiet, keep it hidden, keep it a secret. I didn't want anyone to know about it. Almost as if I had done something wrong, not him. I was too ashamed to let people know about it. Too embarrassed. I, I know people would think, why does she stay? Why does she put up with it? Didn't you ever wonder why my side of the family didn't call round to the house or invite us to their family parties and get-togethers? They fell out with him a long time ago when they saw the real him. Not the show he puts on to people who didn't really know him. They fell out with me because I wouldn't stand up to him. Only because I knew if I did I would get worse hidings from him and because he told me if I ever left him he'd set fire to the house so I'd never get it and he'd find me and make sure he got custody of you when you were a lot younger and he'd make sure I never saw you again. You never knew what was going on. When you were young you were always asleep in bed when he was at his worst and later you'd moved out to go to uni so I kept it from you always putting on a front so that you didn't know yeah I'm gonna tell everyone all of this I'm sorry but I have to even though you'll be upset and you along with everyone else won't believe it because none of you have ever seen it. But believe me, it's true. All of it. I've got to do it for my own sanity. And I'm apologising in advance. I want you to know, now, now he's dead and he can no longer do me any harm. Forgive me. But it's got to be done. I can't stand the thought of today without me doing it. Everyone saying what a great fella he was. Everyone sympathising with me about my loss and feeling sorry for me. Asking how I'm going to cope without having him and so on. But I want them to know that I'm not sad. I'm happy. I'm looking forward to my life without him. I'm looking forward to a happy life. Doing things I want to do. Going places I want to go. And living the life I want to live. Forgive me sweetheart, but I've got to do it. Please understand. 
please support me. Please. That was I'll Remember You by Anne Pritchard and acted by Jill Powell and it was a Make It Right production for Make It Heard. This is Shame On You by Anne Pritchard and it's performed by Sinead Cullen Barrett for Make It Heard. It was funny last night. Well, not really. I come home from work, went upstairs as usual and got changed. God, it was a relief to get me pantsy girdle off. It was cutting into me something awful. I put a long sweater on over my skirt so I could keep the zip down halfway and button undone under the waist. I let out a deep breath as I put my slippers on. As I went downstairs, the smell of food made me mouth water. I was starving. We were all sitting at the table having our tea. Most days, it was three different meals as me and our kids are so fussy. Don't normally like what's on offer. Except on Friday nights. Tonight. Friday night is steak pie night. We both loved it. Mam's homemade steak pie. Chunks of meat nestling under a delicious short crust pastry. It was a mystery as to how she'd make it. I'd watched her making it. It's just a handful of this, a pinch of this, handful of that. No measuring or anything like that. It just always turns out great. Comes out the oven looking delicious. We had boiled potatoes and veggies. Well, I just had peas as usual. It's the only veg I like. And I was doing my usual, making a pea bussy. Plenty of butter on the bread and... I was just ladling on the gravy over the peas and about to put the other slice of bread on top and then Dad says, oh, it's no wonder you're putting on weight, girl. It's all these bussies you make for your dinner. You're eating too much bread. Look how heavy you're getting. You'll have to knock them butties on the head, girl. Well, I didn't know where to look. My face must have gone bright red. Dad hardly ever says a word. And he sometimes to mam to moan if there's something wrong with his tea. He always sits quiet in the corner, doing his crossword, and watching the telly. <sighs> I thought I was hiding it okay. I didn't think I was showing that much. Just goes to show how wrong I was. Well, oh, you could have cut the air with a bread knife. Mam just sat down with her dinner and I saw him exchange glances. Dad looked shocked. Mum had that knowing look on her face. Must come with age. I think they both know now. Our kid just kept on eating her dinner. 
oblivious to it all, asking for seconds. A couple of days later, a kid told me she was walking up the street coming home from school. And she saw the window cleaner perched on his ladder outside our house. Well, he wasn't exactly cleaning the windows. As he had saw her walking towards the house and he pointed at the house and says, There's murder going on in there, love. She said she could hear the shouting getting louder. She got closer. Then she walked in. She found me, in tears, trying to hold it back. I looked from mum to her, from dad to her, and she asked what was going on. And they told her I was pregnant. It was 1965, the swing in 60s. Shotgun marriages were the norm if a girl was pregnant. If babies were born out of wedlock, it brought immense shame on the parents and grandparents of the pregnant girl. Girls were shipped off into the country when they were up the duff until they gave birth and returned home a lot thinner and much sadder, minus their offspring, who'd have been left in an orphanage or with relatives or adoptive parents. Our kid was beyond angry with me for getting myself into trouble. The pill had been available for about five years, so why hadn't I been sensible and gone on it? She shouted at me. She told me straight what an idiot I was. She told me to get rid of it. I was going to humiliate them all by getting fatter and fatter each day, only to produce a screaming embarrassment in about six months, she asked me. She said she couldn't live with the shame. She cursed me every day for causing all this trouble. I was adamant I was keeping the baby. I'd fallen out with me fella some months earlier, but I knew I was pregnant, and he'd taken up with another girl and he'd also got her pregnant. Their wedding was going to be in a few weeks. I couldn't bear the thought of getting rid of the baby. No way I could do that. My best friend told me her cousin had tried drinking gin whilst having a boiling hot bath method last year and it hadn't worked. I wasn't going to go on to an old deer in a grubby backstreet clinic who'd used knitting needles on me in the kitchen table. Adoption was out of the question. No way I could go through the pregnancy and the delivery and all that and have to get my baby adopted. No, this kid was mine and I was keeping it. I knew the shame and embarrassment it would bring on the family. I knew there'd be more tears. They'd have to ride it out. was Shame on You by Anne Pritchard and it was acted by Sinead Cullen Barrett. This is a Make It Right production for Make It Heard. This is Sweet Revenge by Anne Pritchard, acted by Elizabeth Hardy for Make It Heard. Do you like my hat? I thought it was a bit of fun really. I didn't want anything too over the top, too ostentatious. You know what I mean. Typical mother of the bride creation, all net and feathers. I'm not mother of the bride anyway, I'm mother of the bridegroom. I've just slipped out of the reception to have my hair tidied up. Well, what I thought was I'd have it up like this in a French plait for the service and the wedding breakfast. It matches the bridesmaid, you see. They've all, they've all got theirs the same. And then I thought when it's in that in-between time, after the wedding breakfast and the speeches, when there's a bit of a lull, 
I thought, I'll nip in here and get Cheryl to take my hair down and give it a quick once over for the night time. I want it down and all bouncy for the evening. She's ever so good, Cheryl. Said she'd fit me in whenever. We're only over the way in the hotel opposite. Do you know it? Alicia, ever so nice. She said she'd come over to the hotel, but I said, no, I'll pop over here. It'll give me a breather from everything. And I know she has a regulars to see to on a Saturday. They've gone into the park now to have their photos done, the bride and groom. So everyone's having a break. Perfect time for me to have my hair done. Ooh, these shoes are killing me. I'll have to take them off for a mo. I shouldn't really. I mightn't get them back on. <laughs> but I'll have to. Ooh. Ooh, that's heaven. Have you seen the heels on them? Four and a half inches. I'll never wear them again. Oh well. So what? It's not every day your son gets married, is it? I'm just so happy for them. They're perfect together. Made for each other. They're so happy. It shouldn't have been till next year, you know, the wedding. But I persuaded them to bring it forward. Well, it didn't take much persuading. But they needed the extra time to save up enough money for the wedding. But I said, look, I'll lend you the money you need. I'll be giving you some money towards the wedding anyway. But the extra you were going to save up, I'll lend you that. And then you can pay me back after the wedding. You can give me back the money you were going to save each month. So it's just the same. And you can have the wedding earlier instead of waiting. I know they want to start a family, you see. So the sooner they're settled, the better. He likes to do everything properly, our Noel. He's old-fashioned like that. They were courting for about a year and they got engaged last Christmas. He even went to see Gemma's dad to ask permission before he proposed. Then, on Christmas morning, they'd opened all the presents that, that were around the tree and Noel says to Gem, I'm sure there's another present for you. Go and have a look. She went and had a look by the tree but said, no, there's nothing else. So he says, take a look on the tree, it must be there. And sure enough, she found it, the ring, hanging from one of the branches where he put it. Proper romantic he is. We were all made up. She's a lovely girl. They're good together. So then it was full steam ahead for organising the wedding. First thing I had to get my head around was that I'd be seeing him, my ex, Noel's dad, and her the one he was carrying on with behind my back for two years. No, it was more like three. His firm had been taken over and all the engineers had to be relocated to Warrington. It wasn't too far to travel down the motorway. At least he didn't lose his job. He used to come home and tell me about all the people in the new office. We'd have a laugh about them over a drink in the evening. I'd be eager to catch up on the office gossip. I wasn't working then. Too busy with the boys and the house. So I'd look forward to it. Then he started to mention her name, Susan. He'd drop it into the conversation. Telling me how she'd been left on her own. She'd had to divorce her husband. He'd had an accident. Some sort of head injury. And it had made him money mad. It gambled all the money away. She was left with nothing. Poor girl, I'd said at the time. Poor girl, my eye. They were carrying on all that time and I didn't have a clue. Clandestine meetings in the office corridors, lunchtime rendezvous and so on. I didn't suspect a thing. He seemed different, kind of preoccupied at times, but I thought he was worrying over his job. I even thought he was going through the male menopause. 
but I was too busy most of the time with the boys and so on. I suppose that was it. I wasn't giving him enough attention and he was getting it from her. 25 years we were married. Well, would have been that year. We'd known each other for 35 years. We were childhood sweethearts. I was 13 when we met. My first real boyfriend he was. You're better off without him, Mum, my youngest son, Tom said. Look at you now. You're a different person. You'd never have accomplished what you've done over the years if you'd still been married to him. You were well rid of him. It surprised me saying that, but it's right. We used to do a lot of walking together, me and my ex. I'd always wanted to be a botanist back then. I love wildflowers and nature. He liked the walking part, so we'd go rambling in the countryside. It gave me a chance to indulge my passion, and the exercise was good. Funnily enough, that's what they used to do, my ex and her, Susan. They'd go walking with the social committee at work. I should have suspected something then. He was never one for joining things. It was always just the two of us. But I encouraged him, and next thing was he was organising the social outings. That was how he could get to see more of her. And then one day he says to me, I'm going to start going into the office earlier in the morning. It's quieter then. I can get more work done. Finish off all the reports I need to do. He wasn't going into the office at all. He was going to her house before work each morning. I've heard of afternoon delight, but this was first thing in the morning delight. I was so naive. I didn't suspect a thing. I was too trusting. I haven't seen him since the divorce. Never wanted to. But once the wedding was arranged, I couldn't help thinking it'll be strange seeing him with her in the church. You'll be fine, Mum, my youngest said. Keep your head held high and a big smile on your face. You'll get through it. You've done nothing to be ashamed of. It's them that should be worried. You're a different person to the one who is married to him. You've got your degrees, your career, and you've got your new book coming out. You're a minor celeb. He gave me a big kiss and a hug and it brought tears to my eyes, I can tell you. But it made me feel so good. I'd had a hard time keeping this week free. I just managed it by shifting things around a bit, juggling the presentation dates. As soon as they decided on a date for the wedding, I told my PA, on no account book anything in for me for the week leading up to the wedding. I need to be around in case of any last minute help they'll need. I wasn't ready for the shock to come though. The first shock that was. They've been talking about churches, which one to get married in. And one day they called around and said they made up the mind. It was the church Gemma had always wanted to get married in. The one she'd always imagined herself walking down the aisle in. All saints in the village. It was the church I'd got married in 40 years ago. I can see why she wanted that church. Same reasons I'd wanted it. Beautiful old church. It's got the lynch gate at the front and the beautiful stained glass window over the altar. Well, what could I say? If that's the church they wanted, I wanted everything to be perfect for them. I said, okay, I'll just have to take a deep breath on the day. I thought to myself and hope I don't get too emotional. I had a few months to get used to it anyway. She kept me involved with everything, Gemma. She didn't have to, did she? But she invited me along to see the dress she'd chosen and I went along to the fittings with the bridesmaids to see their dresses. Cappuccino they are. Not what I'd have chosen, but then it's fashionable apparently. It's in at the moment. Noel suits dark brown too, and a gold cravat to match. But that was the next shock. 
the bridesmaids. I'd asked her early on who she was having and she told me Ruby, my granddaughter, my youngest son's daughter, would be a flower girl and her two best friends would be the bridesmaids. Lovely, I'd said at the time. Then they said they had something to tell me. This was a couple of months ago. They hadn't known how to tell me before, but they'd asked my ex and Susan's daughter to be the other bridesmaid. Oh yeah, didn't I say? They had a daughter. She'll be 15 now, nearly 16. Yeah, just after they got married, she was desperate for a baby. And her body clock was ticking, wasn't it? She was in her 40s then. But him? He was 50. A baby at 50. What a bloody idiot. Nappies and prams and bottles and cots at 50. Starting all over again with a baby when he should have been thinking of, I don't know, downsizing the house, I suppose. The boys would have been away at uni then. And we'd have been looking forward to our time together again. Maybe buying a place abroad, planning for his retirement, I don't know. So now I had this other bombshell to deal with. Not only did I have to put up with my ex-husband and his mistress stroke wife at my son's wedding in the church where I'd married him, but their daughter was to be a bridesmaid. I felt betrayed all over again, I can tell you. It brought it all back again. The lies, the deceit, that was the worst thing. Being deceived like that. But I'd have to put my smiley face on, wouldn't I, and go along with it all. I thought I'd go over to the church last week. I thought it'd be a good idea to go there. The only time I've been there since I was married was for the boys' christenings all those years ago. But I thought I'd better go just to see how it felt. I didn't want to let them down on the day, did I? So I went over there last Sunday. I stayed for the service. It was lovely. Such a beautiful church. I think it dates back to the 13th century. After the service, I thought I'd have a stroll around the small graveyard at the back. Have you been there at all? It's lovely. So quiet and peaceful. I sat down on the bench just to collect my thoughts. I'm not religious. I believe in God, though. Always have done. And when I was inside the church, I said a little prayer. Just to ask him to help me get through today, not to let myself down or them. And I was sitting on the bench with my eyes closed, just resting and enjoying the late sunshine. When I opened my eyes, I could see a shaft of light from behind the church, going all the way down to the bottom of the beautiful oak tree in the middle of the graveyard. And it seemed to be willing me to go over to see what it was shining on. So I went over to inspect the flowers around the tree. And there... Nestled in the middle of the wild pansies and bluebells was something that gave me an idea. Back then I told my ex I could never forgive him for what he'd done, for all the hurt he'd caused to me and the boys, leaving me for a trollop like her. I'd let him come back, you know. Yeah, he'd asked me to take him back. I said, OK, it was for the boys more than for me. I didn't want them to be products of a broken marriage, seeing their dad at weekends and so on. So I took him back. And what happened three months later? He was seeing her again. Yeah, after all he'd said. How he didn't know why he'd done it, what a mistake he'd made, how sorry he was. And it started all over again. That was it then. I'd had enough. That was the end. But now, nearly 16 years later, so much has happened. I've got so much to be grateful for. If it wasn't for the divorce, 
I wouldn't be where I am now. It's a different life. I'm a different person. I made myself different. I had to. I was alone then with two kids to support. I had to pick myself up and think about making a new life for them and myself. That's how I got into providing self-interest holidays. Flora and fauna for beginners. It's amazing how it took off. Who'd have thought? I travel up and down the country now and abroad, doing workshops and presentations. And not only that, it's big on cruise ships now. The Silver Hair Brigade with a few bob to spend, they love it. I did a book signing on the QE2 last month. Sales have gone through the roof. Amazon can't keep up with the demand. So maybe I should bury the hatchet. Maybe it's about time, forgive and forget and all that. That's when I came up with my little idea. I thought I'll make something for the wedding breakfast, something to eat, petty four or chocolate truffles, something like that. So that's what I did, just for the guests on the top table. I personalised them with little name tags to make sure the ones with the special ingredients I'd included, the ones I'd found by the oak tree, got to the right people. My ex and Susan. Theirs had the wild toadstools finely grated and mixed in them with extra chocolate so that they wouldn't taste any bitterness. Yeah, it was only last week at the book signing I was telling an old deer to be careful picking the mushrooms growing in her back garden, not to mistake them for the toadstools I'd found last week. It's easily done, and they're lethal, I told her. You'll not only have a nasty tummy upset, you'll be drawing your last breath 24 hours later. Before I came over here, I watched them eating my homemade delights my ex and Susan. I told the manager they were a surprise for afters once they got the speeches over and done with. And I asked him to serve them as a special on the house kind of thing, but not to let on I'd made them. I couldn't help smiling as I watched the meeting. That was my afternoon delight. By the time they feel the effects, I'll be on the plane, high up in the sky. I've got to pick up the ship in Tenerife this time. It's a cruise around the Med, so it should be nice. Yeah, my son's right. I'm a different person altogether now. Now, where's Cheryl got to? Must look my best for this evening. That was Sweet Revenge by Anne Pritchard and acted by Elizabeth Hardy for Make It Hers. This is Heads You Lose by Anne Pritchard, recorded by Mary Savage for Make It Heard.
Got the green light today. Got the go ahead for the visit. Came by email. Prison visits are back on now, the lockdown's eased a bit, so I'm making plans to go and see me dad. It'll take most of the day to get there, mind you. I'll have to get the train and then a taxi from the station. Gonna cost a bit as well, but I've made my mind up to go and see him. Now I'm 18, I'm allowed. I wonder if he'll recognise me. It's been five years after all. Five years. I was just a kid when it all happened. Only 13. Seems like a lifetime ago now. And I've been paying the price for his actions all this time. I've had to live with the shame. I've had to lie my way through life. Hide me past. Put up with being chased and hounded by the press. And then when they discover where I am, trying to sideline them. Dissuade them from wanting to interview me. Put them off wanting to find out more details for their gossipy rags. Deter them wanting to know my side of the story and then having to move on yet again. Moving from place to place. Lying about my family. Not having any friends and if I do get friendly with someone, having to make up a past. Saying all my family have died in some fictitious freak accident story and then having to endure their sympathy. Why have I had to suffer it all? I haven't done anything wrong. I was just caught up in it all. Like all of us kids. Our oh, Jordan's alright. He's been adopted. Taken off of my mum when she was at her worst. On the drugs. He was only a kid. Four, I think. He's well out of it with... A well-off family somewhere in Manchester. He's done okay. He won't even remember me mum and dad or me and our Maddie. Is it if they'll ever tell him what happened? Will he ever want to go looking for his birth mum and dad? I'll get a right shock if he does. And our Maddie? What about her? A baby? Two she was. And after it happened, Auntie Tracy wasn't even allowed to adopt her. They said it wouldn't work. Wouldn't work being with close family members. She'd be too close to where it all happened. She'd be better off right away from it all, they said. God knows where she is now. Taken into care. Will she have been adopted? God only knows. I couldn't even keep in touch with them. My own brother and sister. Well, half brother and sister. We've all got different dads. Mum was doing okay though. When it happened, she'd been off the drugs and she had a job cleaning the bus depot in the town centre. The papers said she loved it. She had a new fella and she'd been out with him that night. Must have been a good night because she didn't get back home till the early hours. Dad had been texting her non-stop, hundreds of texts, the police said, when they found her phone. He'd been desperate to get back with her. She'd been ignoring him, said he was bad news, didn't want anything more to do with him. Said she was moving on, moving on with her new fella. Suppose Dad was jealous, or something. He must have thought if she wouldn't have him back, no one else was going to have her. I want to ask him what really happened that night. That fateful night. Her last night alive. I know she eventually agreed to see him. After getting home, she gave in and went straight out again. Agreed to meet him. But there must have been an argument, a fight that led to what he did. Murdering her. He wouldn't tell the police anything. He didn't even own up to the murderer first. He wouldn't tell why he did it or how he got rid of her body. Wouldn't tell where he buried her. 
or how he'd got Uncle Matt to help him bury her body. Well, bury the body part. They cut up her body and burned the part in bin bags all over the place. Most of them behind that derelict pub besides the canal. They dredged the canal at first, thinking he'd thrown her into the water. He must have been laughing his head off, knowing they were on the wrong track. Those poor divers, in the middle of winter, the canal was all frozen. They were at it for days, but no result. It was a man walking his dog who came across the first package. Well, the dog came across it, sniffing at it and not wanting to leave it alone. It wasn't buried deep enough, you'd say, and the smell must have been overpowering. The body parts putrid by that time. God, what a friggin' horrible way to die. What a friggin' horrible thing to do to a person and to get your brother to help you. What sort of person does that? He's got a lot of questions to answer. I'm going to make a list while I'm on the train so we don't forget any of them. But there's one question I won't forget. The one I want the answer to before I can carry on with my life. The one thing you wouldn't tell the police or anyone. Where did he bury her head? That was Heads You Lose by Anne Pritchard and performed by Mary Savage. And it's a Make It Right production for Make It Forward. by Anne Pritchard. Ah, what a beautiful day. Blue skies, temperature in the 20s and a light breeze. Perfect day for a wedding. My wedding. We couldn't have planned it to be more perfect if we'd tried. Six months ago we did all the planning, booked the reception and so on. The Palm House in Sefton Park, no less. I'd always wanted to get married there from when they first said it could be done. I had my heart set on it. And I got my wish. Six months ago, we got engaged on Christmas Day. What a day. Our first Christmas together. The first time we'd had a Christmas Day together and it was so lovely. That's the day he proposed. We'd opened all our prezzies and then he said, I think there's something else on the tree for you. No, I said. Can't be. I've opened them all. Take another look, he says, grinning. So I goes over to the tree and he starts saying, cold, getting warmer, 
warm, hot, hot, red hot. And then I found it, just behind the bauble with our initials on. A little box wrapped in beautiful gold paper with a bow on top. Next thing I know, he's down on one knee, grinning like a Cheshire cat, while I'm trying to open the wrapping on the present, but I'm all fingers and thumbs because I'm so excited and nervous and I rip it off with my teeth in the end. And then the two of us are laughing our heads off and I say yes! And we end up ripping each other's clothes off and have it away on the rug in front of the fire. We'd known each other for six months before he proposed and they were the best six months of my life, honestly. We had such good times. He was always making me laugh and always surprising me with little gifts and leaving little notes for me to find. He was so easy to talk to, tell my troubles to when I was feeling down. If something had gone wrong at work or with one of my mates, he was so understanding and we were on the same wavelength, as they say, with everything. Everyone loved him as well. He could charm the birds off the trees. Everyone always said to me, he's so easy going, so laid back and always laughing. You're so lucky. He's got the lot. Good looks, great personality and he's so generous too. Yeah, I couldn't believe my luck. I had to pinch myself sometimes in case I was dreaming. He wouldn't let me pay for a thing. He said my money was my money and his money was too. He'd paid for everything for the wedding and the surprise honeymoon. He said it was somewhere I'd always wanted to go, but never thought I'd be able to afford. He said to be prepared for a long flight and that I wouldn't need anything but a bikini for every day and a posh dress for the evenings. Oh, I couldn't wait. He moved in once we were engaged. He said it made sense. Why pay out for two homes when we could be together in one at half the expense? I suppose it made sense, so I went along with it. He said he would take care of all the bills and so on, and so I handed all the house management over to him, and I was happy to do it at the time. I felt like I was being looked after, and I was enjoying it. He said I didn't have to worry about a thing anymore. It was all in his hands, and that's how it would stay. He liked to pick me up after I finished work. He finished earlier than me. He was a tutor at a sixth form college near to where we lived and he dropped me off in the morning at my office on his way to college, so it made sense. He always called me during the day to see how my day was going, which seemed really sweet at first, but then sometimes if I was busy in a meeting or something and didn't answer, he'd be annoyed and almost wanted to know why I wasn't able to answer his calls. It started to irritate me after a while and I started to dread him calling. It seemed like he was checking up on me or something when there was nothing to check up on. I was in work after all. One evening, he saw me coming out of the office chatting to Jamie, a colleague from my department. When I got in the car, he was all moody, wouldn't talk to me at first and was quiet all night. I couldn't understand what was going on but it was the first of many of his moods if he caught me talking to another man, even on the phone. His moods became darker if I decided to join my mates for a night out. He said he didn't understand why I wanted to go out with them when I could go out with him to the pub or for a meal. I tried to explain how I'd always gone out with my friends. I'd had them for a long time and they'd be upset if I didn't see them occasionally. And anyway... I wanted to see them. I didn't want to lose touch with them. But he wasn't convinced. And he never had a good word to say about any of my friends. He found fault with all of them. Not just the fellas, the girls too. He said they were only out to get drunk and cop off with anyone who looked twice at them. Said they all wore their clothes too tight or too low. He made me feel self-conscious about what I wore and I made sure not to buy anything I thought he wouldn't like. As time went on, his moodiness seemed to be the norm, and the first time he hit me was a shock. He said I talked back to him, back-chatted him or something. I've never heard that expression before. And he said I should have more respect for him. After all, he was the main wage earner, paying for everything and looking after me. 
He said I should be more grateful. As time went on, he started to find more faults with me. Nothing I did pleased him, and the smacks turned into full-on hidings. He was clever, though. He knew where to hit me so that it didn't show. I was black and blue all over, but he expected me to keep smiling and do everything I could to please him. Then the coronavirus started. He was laid off on furlough, so as well as taking me to work and picking me up, he'd meet me for lunch and sometimes hang about outside the office till I finished work. Everyone remarked on how lucky I was to have found someone like him and would say, Bet you can't wait for the wedding, not long now. Oh, to be honest, I was having second thoughts, but I didn't know how I could get out of it. His violent temper and rages meant I could hardly give an opinion on anything if it differed to his. Never mind, think of a way of broaching a subject of a break from each other or not going ahead with the wedding. It was unthinkable. My weight had plummeted. Everyone thought I was on a diet for the wedding, but I was too stressed all the time to enjoy food any more. I never knew when the next blow was coming. I was afraid to open my mouth in case what I said would upset him, so I kept quiet, hardly speaking whilst I was with him. Consequently, I felt a bag of nerves all the time, walking on eggshells literally. He had his own thoughts on the coronavirus pandemic. He said he didn't believe anything the politicians were saying. He said it was a load of BS. He wasn't going to change his lifestyle. He said he was going to carry on as normal. No social distancing for him and no way was he washing his hands more than the usual or every time he went to the shops. He started with the dry cough at first but dismissed it as a bit of a cold. Said I'd had too many windows open in the house and he must have been sitting in a draught. Then, one night, after complaining that the meal I'd made was tasteless, he started burning up and he had a terrible high temperature. I isolated with him but kept him at a distance, leaving his meals outside his bedroom door and sleeping in the spare room. One evening, I looked in on him and he was breathless, fighting for breath, so I called an ambulance. He's in intensive care now, incubated. He can't have any visitors, and doctors say he's got a fighting chance. Every night I'm praying. I have never prayed so hard and as much in all my life. I'm praying that he doesn't regain consciousness. I'm praying that he doesn't discover that I've cancelled the wedding. The wedding that should have been today. This beautiful, beautiful day. I'm praying with all my heart that he doesn't recover, that he isn't one of the lucky ones who pulls through. If there's any sign of that, I'll be getting the bags I've already packed, putting my mask and gloves on and taking off somewhere far away. Far away from him and the dreadful life he's put me through for the past 12 months. Whilst everyone else whose loved ones are in ICU fighting for their lives or hoping and praying for them to pull through, I'm praying with everything I've got that he won't. Can you blame me for that? In the meantime, I've rescheduled the honeymoon to new dates next year. The Maldives. I can't wait. Hopefully things will be back to some sort of normal by then and me and my mates can enjoy the beautiful villa he's arranged for us on that sun-soaked private beach. Fate's a strange thing. Who'd have thought I'd be so grateful to an infectious disease causing a pandemic worldwide?
That was Simple Twist. It was by Anne Pritchard and performed by Claire Kelly. This is a Make It Right production for Make It Hers. Mama, You've Been On My Mind, a monologue by Anne Pritchard. The cab stopped outside the run-down block of apartments. As I paid the driver, he said, Hey, I wouldn't linger around here too long. Bit of a rough neighbourhood, just saying. Hell, I know, I said. It's okay, I won't be here long. Right, well, take care. Here's my card if you need a cab back home. I said thanks and put it in my pocket. I walked down the driveway to the front entrance to the shabby building and put the key in the door. The smell hit me straight off. Musty and damp with an underlying smell of rotten eggs or wheat worn socks. Couldn't decide which. I walked slowly up the stairs to the first floor and the memories came flooding back. All the times I've visited such a long time ago now. I used to drop in most days on my travels for a coffee and a talk. My job meant I passed nearly every day so it was easy to call in during my lunch break and say hi. I arrived at the front door of the small apartment. I was a little breathless. The stairs seemed steeper than I remembered and well, there seemed to be more of them. Well, hey, I was a lot younger then. It's probably easier for me. <laughs> The key didn't seem to fit at first. I had a job getting it in the front door. and Maybe it was nerves or something, I don't know. Because, well, I was right back there in that narrow hallway. Dad had made the small cloakroom on the left into a study with his computer pried a place on the desk. You could just about squeeze in and sit down at the antiquated device. But he always was busy doing something on it. Help pass the time, he said. For his age, he was very computer literate, keen to advance his learning. He helped me out if I had a problem, was far and away advanced with emails at that time, so we always kept in touch each day after Mom had passed away. I moved across the small bathroom, and as I looked, I remembered how Mom had had her first stroke in there. Then I looked opposite to the bedroom and pictured her on the bed. Small, frail in her house coat, hair unkempt, looking glassy-eyed and unseeing. As the hallway opened up into the small living room, I noticed there were still some framed photos on the walls. I thought we'd packed everything away. I looked at them quizzically. There was me at my graduation with my ex. I looked so young. Next to it, a photo of Dad's family, the Walton clan, he called them, all standing squinting in the California sun. I glanced into the tiny kitchen and immediately I could hear Mom's voice. Your dad made meatballs last night, but he must have put too much chili in them. I was up in the night in the bathroom. I've told him to go easy on it, but he just won't listen. Little did we know then that it wasn't the chilies upset in her stomach. It was that other dark destroyer beginning with C. He's made lasagna for this evening. It's big enough to feed eight. The stale smell of cooking and tomato sauce Seems to have lingered in the kitchen as I stood there thinking about how Mom always used to say garlic instead of garlic. <laughs> and her and Dad didn't say lasagna. They said lasagna. <laughs> oh, Mom was never one to be physically affectionate. 
She would never naturally throw her arms around me or give me a hug and a kiss. Even at Christmas, New Year's Eve, Thanksgiving, her hand came out first for a handshake rather than a hug. I was always fascinated when I met friends with their moms and how they were saying goodbye to each other. Say after we had been to the mall for a short while, they'd be meeting up again and shortly after, how they'd always give each other a hug and a kiss. I never had that with my mom. I always craved it. I couldn't really ever remember her hugging me and giving me a kiss. She just wasn't demonstrative in that way. I still felt loved, no doubt about it. She just wasn't made that way, I suppose. As I stood there, I recalled how Mom started having unexpected falls and all the details of her illness and death came back. I stood there transfixed, as tears streamed down my face. Dad died shortly after, nearly a year to the day. I closed my eyes and wished with all my heart that Mom was there so I could give her a big hug. And as I thought about it, I imagined her standing behind me, cradling me in her arms. Strangely, as I stood there, I could feel arms being wrapped around me, skin on skin, warm flesh holding me lovingly. I leant back to savor the moment and ran my hands down her arms, wanting to hold her hands. And as I touched those hands, I realized with a shock, they weren't hers. They didn't feel smooth and soft like hers. They felt calloused and rough and larger than mom's. With a start, I realized that they were dad's hands. I recognized them and remembered them touching me when I was younger. Not in a dad's way, but in a way I didn't like. You know, a way I remembered hating and wanting desperately for it to stop. I'd never been able to stand up to him then. I'd never been able to tell mom about it. I was ashamed, embarrassed, thinking it was somehow me who made him do it to me. He told me it was natural. Old dads did it with their daughters. His hands started caressing me now and moved along my body. It didn't feel comforting anymore. It felt wrong. I, I knew it was wrong. He was dead, but he was still here, torturing me, trying to invade me once more. Now I was stronger, I was able to confront him, as I should have done all those years ago. I wanted to face him, challenge him, tell him what I thought about him. I knew I could do it now and I wanted to do it. I ran to the kitchen and took the biggest knife from the block. I saw him watching me. He knew I was ready to challenge him and that I had the strength to do it. I saw his face contorted in a hideous smirk. I knew what I had to do. There was only one way, the way I had to choose to put those demons to bed once and for all. I was holding the knife so tightly my fingers were numb, my hand was sweaty. I raised the knife and saw a glint of sunlight from the window bounce off the blade. I plunged it into my chest. As I saw the blood seep out of my body, I thought of the thought of the tomato sauce he poured over those meatballs he made for mom. Now I could meet him on my terms. Now I could address his hugs and kisses, the ones I did not want from him, the ones I only wanted from mom. 
as I lay there dying. I felt Mom's hand reaching for me and heard her say, I've been waiting for you, sweetheart, waiting to take you in my arms, waiting to kiss you. Come now, you're safe with me. That was Mama, You've Been On My Mind, and it was written by Anne Pritchard and performed by Helen Jones for Make It Hurt. You have been listening to Introducing the Writer. This week's writer was Anne Pritchard. The show was produced by Sharon Coltman and Francis Brody Aldridge. Incidental music was mainly by Jack Myers. This is a Make It Right production for Make It Hers. <laughs>